Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a new SDK we've been working on at Agalia to make uh, developing WebKit GTK a little bit easier. Um, so the agenda, uh, I'm going to cover some of the pain points of working on WebKit GTK, the, the many ways that we currently have to build GTK, and go over some workflows uh, using the new SDK. Um, so, so WebKit GTK is a bit unique in the GNOME ecosystem in that it's, it's a large, modern C++ code base. So unlike most of GNOME, you need a compiler that's very recent, and there's this complex matrix of compilers and C++ standard libraries that you can mix and match, and they all support different versions of, of the language. Um, we have a relatively complex uh, CMake build system. We don't use Mason, unfortunately. Um, and we have a lot of dependencies. We depend on most of the GNOME platform itself. Uh, we depend on GStreamer, including very specific versions of GStreamer and very specific decoders in GStreamer. Uh, we have many build scripts over the decades that have built up in, in Perl, Python, Ruby. Uh, so it's a bit complicated to get it set up. Um, so the most straightforward way of building WebKit is, is of course just building out in the host and we have a script to install dependencies. Um, but this will only work on a few distros that we actually test, very update versions of it. It installs a lot of packages that you don't necessarily want. Um, and a few dependencies we have that we use during development like libbacktrace aren't actually packaged anywhere. Um, so in order to get around this, we use jhbuild historically, um, which many GNOME developers are familiar with. But that kind of just moves the problem. You, you still have a limited number of hosts that are supported, um, but now you have to build all these dependencies on top of it. Um, so it's not very reliable. Uh, people can't reproduce it on their own systems. Uh, so a few years ago, we, we switched to Flatpak, um, which is a huge step forward. It's finally portable, reproducible. Um, but in order to, to do this, we had to maintain our own Flatpak runtime, uh, which is quite complicated using BuildStream. Um, this leads to new problems, though. Since, since you're in Flatpak, you have limited tools. You can't install any tool that you want. Uh, it's a read-only runtime, so if you want to install libraries, you, you can't really do that. Um, and it's a sandbox meant for running applications, not really for development. Um, so it didn't quite fit our use case that well. Um, so, so some things that we wanted a new solution to resolve is that we wanted all traditional development tools to work. We don't, have, we don't want you to have to work around our solution. Uh, we don't want to maintain our own runtime or anything like that. Uh, we want to keep some of the good aspects of, of solutions like Flatpak. So we want it to be reproducible, but we can do better than Flatpak. It's not very good, or our current solution wasn't very good at maintaining multiple versions of the runtime. Um, and we want to be able to develop both libraries below WebKit and applications on top of WebKit. Um, so we, uh, so our new container solution kind of implements the strengths of all those approaches. Uh, we use Podman, so we still get a, a container, um, but for the image, we just use Ubuntu. It, it has long-term support. It's very common. People understand it, um, and we continue to use JHBuild on top of that because it's quite useful as a developer tool for building things, which we'll get into. Um, so the basic usage couldn't be more straightforward. You, you just clone the repo and add it to your path. Uh, we have a script that creates a new container. You can create as many containers as you'd like. Um, and then you enter that container. Once you're in the container, you just build WebKit. Everything's there. Everything works as expected. Um, it's under MIT license. You can check it out there. Um, so what we do is we provide a few scripts that you can run on your host. Um, so there's scripts to, to create containers, to run shells in containers, to delete and recreate containers when new versions come, um, and to, to build images locally if you want to customize it. And then inside of the container, we have a few scripts that just uh, help you a little bit, like setting up dev help to read documentation for your current developed version. And we have a script that installs Visual Studio Code and some extensions along with it. 
Um, so this is kind of our, our recommended workflow for developing inside of the container. Um, as it's just an Ubuntu installation, you can use any tools that you traditionally do. But we highly recommend Visual Studio Code with these extensions. It's what we use internally and it works quite well. Uh, whatever editor you choose to use, we recommend Clang D for the C++ integration. Uh, and the main reason for that is that WebKit does this complicated build system solution uh, called unified sources. So what it does is it combines like eight source files into one source file at build time uh, because that reduces the number of files you can compile by one eighth. Um, so it significantly speeds up compilation time for such a large code base. Um, but this breaks any tooling basically because the list of source files no longer matches the, the real list of source files. Um, so very recently we've uh, added some scripts that expand out these files back into the, the correct ones. Um, but it only specifically works if you use Clang D currently. Any, any other tooling will need to, to manually handle this. Um, and we also recommend LLDB instead of GDB. GDB will work completely fine. Um, but WebKit has a large um, base library and it doesn't necessarily use the C++ standard library for everything. And uh, Apple maintains a LLDB script that adds uh, type information and formatting for, for things like strings, hash maps, bit, bit masks, and things like that. Um, and you can simply import the script when you run LLDB. Um, and so here's an example of running it under LLDB. As you can see with the new value variable, it shows that it's a string. By default, you just you know, see, see basic uh, structures. Um, and everything works in LDB, is very similar to GDB that you're familiar with. Uh, another complication is that WebKit is multi-process. So a lot of editors and tools, uh, when, when the debugger attaches to it, it just attaches to the main process. And that's not very helpful because most of your development is going to be in the web processes or the network process. Um, so you really need an editor that makes it easy to, to do this. Uh, in WebKit or in Visual Studio, it, it's quite a simple drop down where you just select the, the process you want to attach to. Uh, unfortunately, the configuration for that's a little bit manual, um, but you have to list the processes that you want it to attach to. Uh, another complication is that WebKit has a lot of build scripts that expect things to work in a very specific way. So we have a script that calls CMake for you with all the flags and, and the build directory that it expects. Um, and other scripts like run WebKit tests rely on a lot of these assumptions, which is uh, complicated when you use uh, an editor. Um, but CMake has this really useful feature called presets. Um, so if you run CMake with the preset, preset of like GTK debug, it will, it will pass all the flags you need and use the build directory that it expects. So all the scripts work normally. Um, and in Visual Studio Code, it just has a drop down where you select whatever preset you want and, and ha handles everything for you. Um, and we continue to use JHBuild. It's, it's maybe not the prettiest tool in the world, but it's, it's quite effective for what our development workflow is. Um, so we include a module set that has all of the popular known projects like glib, libsoup, epiphany, gstreamer. Um, so these are things that you'll regularly build. Um, here's an example of, of building glib. We, we always put it in the checkout directory. Um, so you can just make changes there and then reinstall it to easily test different glib versions or patch glib. Um, running Epiphany is also a really, really good way of testing WebKit, um, which is quite tricky to do with Flathack before. Um, so as long as you install WebKit into the JHBuild prefix, um, it's just two simple commands to build Epiphany on top of the development version of WebKit that you use. Um, and so that's basically the, the summary of uh, our development workflow using this new SDK. Um, there, there's one minor addendum. A week ago, these Clang D changes worked. This week, those Clang D changes don't work. 
next week the Kling D changes will work again. So there's a, there's a pull request to, to fix these things. Um, and, and that's basically all from me. If anybody has any questions. Hey, uh, Clang D stuff. Um, we have support for it in Builder, but we don't enable enable it by default. Um, do you think we should be switching to Clang D? That's one of the first questions. And the other one is for the drop down processes. Does the LLDB stuff connect to all of the processes up front, or will it connect to them when you select it from the menu? Uh, so regarding Clang D. Uh, I mean, your complaints about Clang D are completely valid. Maybe you could auto detect that you're using, you're developing WebKit and just use Clang D for that project. Cool. Um, so, for the processes, if you're on uh, Mac OS and you use Xcode, it's really nice because it automatically detects all of them and connects to all of them. Uh, Visual Studio does not do that. You have to manually connect to them each time. Um, so, that means like if they break, you just automatically get a breakpoint because they're already connected in the background. You will have to connect ahead of time. Okay. Correct. I guess I guess I was curious is like what we would need to do from the automation standpoint. Like we can follow the process tree and show you all the processes and then but it's like to make you connect to them, they need, you know, like that that parent debugger process. So do we have some sort of hooks that will go in and start the superior process or and I'm just curious I guess how LLDB is going about making sure it has access to these. I mean if I were adding this to Builder I would honestly just hard code WebKit. <laughs> I feel like it's a very specific use case yeah. and I assume that's what they do in Xcode. I don't know. Um, it, it's kind of tricky to, to follow all the child processes because they're not like direct children. Yeah. Like it launches a new sandbox and it's, it's a separate process tree and everything. So I don't know how easy it would be to, to automatically do that. Okay. Well, anyway, if you can, if you figure out how they're doing it there and write it up, you know, we can certainly change the architecture to accommodate it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you write WebKit dev set up VS code, uh, are you installing it on the host or in the container? So all of this runs inside of the container. Okay. Um, one, one of the goals of this container was uh, a big problem with Flatpak is that all the tools had to adapt to Flatpak on the host. Um, so the, the strategy for this is you just install your tools in the container and they don't need to understand anything about containers. Could you run it on the host and SSH into the container to develop it or are a lot of the things not going to work then? Uh, yeah, you don't even need to SSH in. Um, we have if I can find it. So the uh, enter command, you can simply pass commands to run. So you could uh, wkdev enter dash dash command clang or whatever. And oh. it will on the host run a command in the container. Um, so I guess that would be similar to like how GNOME Builder runs things inside of containers. It could have specifically support for our container solution if it wanted. Cool. Um, so I guess first to quickly um, say something to Philip's um, question about running uh, VS Code in the host. I mean, there we do have something called Toolbox VS Code. It's a very it's a fancy shell script that hooks up um, VS Code on the host to a toolbox and uses Visual Studio's remote containers extension. It actually works really well, but you know. So if, if you're interested in doing something like that, you can look at that. It, you sort of forget that you're actually not doing things inside the uh, Visual Studio actual, like inside the SDK or whatever. It just sort of pretty seamlessly clicks to a toolbox. So I guess uh, my, but actually my question was, so I mean you clearly created your own custom solution there. I'm wondering if you looked at things like toolbox, distrobox, dev containers, and what, is there, do you think there could be things to done to like say extend toolbox so it could be used 
instead of doing this custom, or is it basically inherently custom because you're just too complex and web kitty? Um, I would say it's the opposite. It, our, our, what we want is actually more simple than all these other solutions. Um, you know, these, these commands basically wrap a single podman command. Uh, we didn't really see value added in all these tools on top of, of Podman. Um, they're, they're very small, simple bash scripts. And um, how we use Podman is we disable basically all isolation that we can. We don't use it for security reasons. We, the only thing we isolate is your home directory so it doesn't, uh, you know, dirty up your home directory. Um, so it, it is the most simple way of just starting a container that has its own dependencies. Okay. Uh. Um, like you, you can even run like flat packs and stuff inside of the container and it will integrate with the portals on the host and everything. Um, our goal is to be yeah. as close to the host as possible. Okay, I mean, I, I mean, it seems like that the, the sort of overall goals are pretty similar. I mean, you don't have a lot of isolation with toolbox either, but you're saying you just sort of, you went with a different approach because you thought it would work better for what you were doing. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, toolbox is a good project. It's just, it's replacing, uh, you know, 100 lines of bash with thousands of lines of, of whatever toolboxes. We, di we didn't see the value of that complexity. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, obviously, the value you get to if, ever, if we could have things that, you know, make it easier to create solutions like this, that, you know, is that people have less learning to do and, and mm -hmm. things like integration with VS Code or whatever could be shared across different projects. But that's always easier to say from sort of a general, oh, that would be nice if it happened, then let's, I actually want to get something to go and work today type mm -hmm. approach. Yeah. Thank you. And it's very interesting to hear how you, it sounds like you're really making things better for web good developers and easier to get involved in it. Are there any more questions? More of a uh, more of a comment, but I feel like we should take some of the free boff time and do some sort of containerization uh, chat because I find it very interesting. Like the toolbox between this toolbox and everything else, I, it'd be cool to share and, and learn from each other on on how people are containerizing their dev workflows right now. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.